Welcome to the Beyond the Reef podcast, where I talk to experts and researchers in the reef aquarium hobby, discussing a broad range of topics from corals and reef biology to water chemistry and equipment. We take a deep dive into our guests' methods, techniques, and top reef keeping tips. My name is Adam Sutherland, and I am the owner operator of Frag Garage Corals, based out of British Columbia, Canada. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Beyond the Reef. Today I'm joined by Kenny Lin from Pieces of the Ocean. And if you don't know Pieces of the Ocean, you probably should go check out their website at piecesoftheocean.com. Kenny also recently launched a website that's like an auction-based selling platform for coral sellers, uh, obviously only in the United States. And you can go to that at reefandbid.com. And uh, I've been wanting to talk to Kenny for a while because I'm just so blown away by the, the colors and the quality of the corals that I see. And I think this conversation kind of brings us back down to earth from some recent conversations, uh, just in terms of the complexity, because they keep things really simple and I'd say extremely attainable for pretty much any hobbyist. As per usual, I'm going to ask that you guys hit that subscribe button, like, share, comment, reach out to us if you have a question or a suggestion for a future guest. And if you want to make a financial contribution, you can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash beyond the reef podcast. I'd like to thank hobbyist Bobby Heath for his contributions. We're keeping this podcast ad free as long as we can. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with Kenny Lynn from Pieces of the Ocean. All right, man. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm sure a lot of people are curious about your methods and whatnot. So um, maybe a good place to start is like, how did you get from hobbyist to a successful coral business owner? Uh, Well, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, uh, Adam. Um, And um, I, I, I don't I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm that successful yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to, I actually tell my guys that, that don't ever get comfortable. Don't ever feel like you're there. You made it. And then that's when you're, that when you get comfortable and I mean, other people that will work harder and hungrier than you. So, so always stay hungry. Totally. Um, yeah. So it's actually one of my posters in the bathroom for the guys. But, but um, I, 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 I've always had this uh, entrepreneurial, um, Staying with me, and I always wanted to uh, have uh, have my own business, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, and and and, and I, I think I think um, it started out. I'm not sure you're. Um, so, I usually go by the age of my my, my older daughter. So, mm-hmm. I, I kind of started the seriously selling, and when she during the, the after she was born. Mm-hmm. Uh, around that, that uh, paternity leave, when I had that one month paternity for my, my for my for my job, yeah. And then I took that month and I actually uh, built out the basement at my uh, at that time my uh, my parents' house. Nice. And so how many years ago was this? Nine years ago, okay. twenty fourteen. Yeah. And and prior to that, I was in the hobby since about two thousand and and nine. Okay. And um, I was just you know swapping and, and trading with with, with uh, other hobbyists. And I was spending so much money, and and then I I, I kind of looked at myself I'm like, if I'm spending all this money, you know, I got to make something back to 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 cover the expenses. Yeah, so that's one of the money. nice parts of this hobby is that if you are really yeah. successful at it, you have potential yeah. to make money back, right? That, that is if your yeah. core is grow for you, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I was I was selling and trading out of my apartment at the time, and I got again the the, the entrepreneurial side of me uh, kicked in. And I wanted to do it seriously then, but at the same time, you know, um, it's it's fun and all to 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 sell, right? But to 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 sustain a living uh, off of selling coral is a different thing. That's something that I learned. Mm-hmm, and, definitely. And I I think a lot of uh, the the people that are starting out right now, they're holding down a job and then this is a side hustle. So that's kind of like how you how you how you go about learning, making all the mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. But then, because you have a full time job, then your job, your salary from the job can kind of like cover you when you make a costly mistake. Yeah, you but can totally you make go- mistakes, and you know you're kind of floated by your other job, and it's less consequential <laughs> for sure. Right, yeah. right. So, um, so I decided to yeah. So I decided to do it because I was I was dumping a lot of money into it because I was crazy. You know, I, I think now I'm a little bit more grounded and and, and more realistic. Uh, but back then, I, I felt I could do everything. You know, 
Um, so I was like bringing clothes, buying everything, but I couldn't, I couldn't sell because I ended up hoarding everything myself, right? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, a lot of just being a hobbyist at heart, you know, all the nice stuff I, I wanted to keep and grow and then started to cull, you know, get rid of the, you know, stuff that less desirable, mm -hmm. then ended up making no money and got nothing to show for it. So um, then I got to start looking at it and then I, I my kid was born and and then I, I, two years after 2014, I quit my, quit my full-time job to do it. Yeah. Um, and what was your, not, what's your kind of work history leading up to this? I was, uh, I was an app developer. I had a software engineer background. Okay. Um, so I, I had a pretty, like a tech job mm -hmm. at the time. And that's probably uh, been applicable in some ways in terms of getting the sort of tech side of your business going. Hey? Yeah. 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 I mean, using technology to scale the business has been one of the, uh, uh, uh blessing, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I think, I think we 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 kind of walked away from the whole LFS concept, you know, relying on walking. Totally. And then, ge yeah, geographically, we're on an island, and then there's like heavy uh, they, they charge heavy, uh, expensive toilets to travel to our store. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of after the pandemic realized, you know what, the business let's let's shift our focus and, and, and on online, and then kind of focus. Uh, ran the ran the store operation store like a warehouse more than just like a walk-in LFS. Mm -hmm. So um, we stopped selling fish, okay, and then we stock dry goods. We don't stock that much dry goods. Yeah, yeah. You're basically a, a coral farm that lets retail customers people come farm. in, but yeah, yeah. So the thinking behind the fish thing is I, that took a long time for me to to get rid of was that well we're a fish store. How can you be a fish mm -hmm. store without fish, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then if you think about it from a business perspective, you, you, you start thinking about dollar per square footage. Mm -hmm. you, 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 have a, you have a tank, four foot tank in your house, five fish, you know, five, six fish that's really making you money. Um, but whereas that four foot spade, you can, you can grow acro and then you can potentially sell, sell, sell a frag for the same, same price as a fish. Yeah. And then if you grow it, you know, you're able to scale the business where you have enough space to grow it and you, Totally. Potentially the margins are better. And, and, yeah, because I mean, that, fish, you just you bring in the fish, you hopefully it survives quarantine and is healthy and you sell it, but you're not really multiplying, especially exponential multiplication of, of, of fish like, no, versus coral. Not. Yeah. Right. And and, and 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 fish, you don't get that kind of repeat customer once they once they packed out with fish, they mm -hmm. that's it, right? Yeah. I mean, unless they, they, they do something silly and then the fish die. Yeah. But but in the beginning, we, we stressed a lot. I'm not sure. Early on, early on, I, I did a thing called polar condition, uh, which was a which was a big hit. Uh, but but for me, it was I was not making any money because I was I was making you know crazy uh, uh, promises like 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 I think I was doing like 14 days or, or 30 days guarantee on fish, mm -hmm. and um, it, it people. Some people, no, not everybody, but people took advantage, and I was making money yeah. fast enough. And then, of course, I incurred losses on my end, but it, it made a good name out of, out of myself. Yeah, know? yeah, and, it's all kind of part of what's contributed to your success today. But um, it sounds like you really kind of have the sustainable side of the business figured out as far as coral. Um, and I guess it'd be kind of an interesting thing to get into because, like, I'm in a similar position. Like, I just grow coral. I'm primarily focused on aquaculture. Like I do bring in corals from overseas and I'm like obviously super picky about it, but you know, I like, you probably know just as much as me, like it's those like tried and tested pieces that are, are kind of the best corals to sell anyways, but you yeah. have to get them to that point. So like, what would you say as far as the inventory that you hold in your store, how much of that space is committed to importing and quarantining like brought in stuff versus stuff that you're farming so right now um well to go back to your original point is is, is inventory and then and selling aquaculture right mm -hmm. so um in the beginning we were bringing we were, we we're doing both but when i opened the store up the tank weren't ready mm -hmm. so you know goes without saying we couldn't sell really much acro uh so we were importing a lot we were bringing a lot of everything yeah, you know, like I said, active fish, uh, uh, LPS, anything that they. And then when, I, when we opened store twenty eighteen, indoor was closed. Yeah, so, yeah, totally, totally. So, so we we were importing. Uh, um, we're doing a lot of Aussie, 
And then we have two customers that pick, pick all the time. But as time changed, right, um, I, I started to see a shift of, of my customers. They, you know, I, I think it has something to do with, with more, um, a lot more information out there now, teaching people how to how to keep uh, SPS course. So it's getting a lot easier for people to keep. Yeah. And um, our customers getting more knowledgeable and, and they are seeking out our culture. Mm-hmm. They, they call, they, they, when they buy something from me, they always ask, how long have you had it? Yeah. You know, how long have you been in captivity? So, um, and then us ourselves, we, 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 we start to see the market shift. So then, then I was like, oh, man, we, we can't always, you know, that wild, but we got to start really growing these, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I think the turning point for us is when our tanks start to turn around. I think, cause we started to store with dry rot. I think this we can go into a little bit of like a uh, yeah. custom retail, mm-hmm. and then it, it kind of like related to uh, how the business was run, uh, because kind of affected it too. Because again, our tank tanks weren't ready, so we we're selling. Uh, we we're trying, you know, we selling everything, you know. So once our tanks start start turning around, I think in, in about twelve month mark, you know, we're struggling with aqua in the beginning. So I'm like, you know what? We tried everything. I went to a couple customers, you know, with established. Tank. Mm-hmm. I know the, the stuff has been around. Yeah. Mature tank. Good classic I took stuff. Lyra. Yeah. I took Lyra from different places. I requested, you know what, let's trade, trade a Lyra for some food or whatnot. I just throw the Lyra into our sumps. Yeah. You know, here and there. And I would say, like, within a couple of months, I can, still, I can start to see, like, growth. You yeah. Know? Growth tip, you know, all that. I'm like, you know, the things that I've been looking for all this time, mm-hmm. right? So once that started to get going, then I was like, you know what, let's let's, let's start selling, selling SPS. Let's start acquiring SPS, right? Yeah. So in the beginning, when Indo first opened up, and then we were like, you know, bringing in different variety of like rainbow tangles in that. But then we also incur a lot of losses, you know, because again, wild pieces, you know how they are. Yeah, they're just, because... they're, they're tricky. There's a lot of like issues with them, obviously, pests, but also there's, I think the green boring algae is a thing I see in a lot of the maricultured stuff. Um, right. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I've, I've heard yeah. a lot about a lot about that. I haven't seen them yet. Um, um, one of the things I used to do is when I, I, when I get con using, I, I try to just like again, you know, we all do this now, debase, but I also chop up the colonies mm-hmm. because when the colonies when they're taken, I, I realize this when it's taken out from the where they grew. So, say for example, a uh, colony they 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 they've been growing in the ocean for three years. Yeah, or they can go in. Same thing, going to town for years. If I took that colony, moved it to a different location, right? Remembering that colony kind of like grew according to every single factor, uh, factor totally. of the environment because they don't yeah. have eyes. Yeah. So the sun moves a certain way, the waves hit a certain way, mm-hmm. and the temperature was a certain consistency. When you take it out, they, they're no longer growing according to those conditions. Yeah. So in our tanks, I looked at the entire colony. I mean, there are exceptions, but most of the time, the entire time becomes like a dormant, you know, they become like encrusted. Yeah, totally. Yeah. They have to figure out where to branch out again. Mm-hmm. Um, so this took a, that takes a lot of the time to sit on it, to condition it. Mm-hmm. So I just, you know what, let me just cut out the colony. Yeah. Take them out. Let me start off as a brand new, brand new individual coral. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, because I, I, I realized, I'm not sure you've seen, I posted on Instagram a couple of times that I have a single coral that from, a, I have two frags from the same single colony. I place them next to each other and, and a lot of hobbies do it just so they can fuse and grow faster. Mm-hmm. But it ended up being going on to their own individual coral. They yeah. never fuse. Oh, crazy. So, huh. Yeah, so they never fuse for me. And yeah. there were cases where if, if they're not touching uh, what they were meant to be fused, I would put one next to the, another coral, a frag, and one would grow a lot faster, a lot quicker than the other. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, that's I interesting. I think once you, once you frag them, they become like they're uh, like sort of like um, I don't know some mutation going on. Yeah, I mean it could be like a maybe a slight change in the microbiome that it has something to do with the coral's immune system and that it you know it's less accepting of you know like accepting yeah. like what should be the exact same genome. It should right. be able what's to touch. Crazy but, that they yeah. did not fuse. Mm-hmm. They ended up acquiring their own. Color. I mean, you can still see similarities, but they they kind of like. 
look different color wise. Interesting. Uh, the flow structure is the same, but yeah. the color is different. Hmm. Yeah. I got to ask Jamie Craig's about that because that's an interesting, interesting point for sure. Because I would assume. Yeah, Jamie you know, Craig's. Yeah. I saw that podcast. Oh, yeah. So interesting. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, I, I like, I like, I like that podcast a lot. Uh, yeah. I actually gained some insight from it. And then uh, kind of affect the way I, I look at uh, looking at what I'm doing now yeah, too. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I'm still kind of still kind of buzzing from that one. There's just so much info in that. When's part two coming? <laughs> What's that? Oh, part two. Part two? Um, he's a busy guy, so I'm hoping uh, maybe yeah, yeah. maybe hopefully in April, but we'll see how soon I can get him. But uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's tons of good stuff in there for sure. Um, I was going to ask you. So you know, I think that's a good uh, practice to frag down you know, your imported colonies to kind of, it's like, I th I'd say the main, I mean, obviously light's quite different in our tanks, but the flow is going to really determine how a large colony has grown. So you're kind of giving it this like starting point that's like a bit more of an open canvas for flow, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They got to feel out the new environment, feel mm -hmm. it out, you know, plus like when we, when we get them in, we beat them up, you know, you dip, 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 yeah. before you dip, and then um, they get beat up a lot. So when you touch them so many times, and then they can move the last so many times, you know, yeah. it's a blank, blank, brand new world for them, you know? Yeah, totally. Would you say, because you've got a pretty good amount of experience with uh, the Malaysian speciosa at this point, would you say that's a good practice for them too? Because generally that's, those are wild colonies that are, you know, five or six inches when they come in. So do you frag them up or do you leave them for a while? So um, I have not. Again, you know, I gotta be honest because they have not been around for that long for me mm -hmm. to really get a good, 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 good grasp. They, it, it's, it's like both for me. I mean, sometimes I frag them up, um, and and you know, some do well, some don't do so well. Um, I, I do think that because when, when a lot of time when, when, when they do peel in, in our tanks, they peel very specific to their own kind. You know, they, yeah, like, yeah. um, like. The whole tank can be doing can 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 be phenomenal, but they somehow get affected by the same I don't know if it's bacteria or toxin, um, and that that, that only they're susceptible, susceptible to. Uh, I even try something like you know sometimes oh you know what, um, like I try dipping. Not I don't I don't. It is you know this is me being a reaper. I try to bathe them in sepal for a whole day. Mm -hmm. I don't see the health. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help. Yeah. Um, what what has helped for me is that uh, you ca once you catch the peeling early enough, mm -hmm. you act fast and start cutting away, and somehow whatever remains can you know sustain. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and you cut probably f further away from the recession than you would kind of want to. Like you have to sacrifice a little bit more than you probably think. But but yeah. It, so yeah. That's my bet. That's my biggest success uh with with is when mm -hmm. cash the peeling early enough and then cut away far, far away from from, from yeah. where the, the, the FCN is going on. And yeah. then whatever tongue I ended up with, that piece started growing and you know, then I let that be my boost Yeah. Like yeah, because like I mean that's one of those corals that I think you know, as a buyer, like you say, your your customers often ask, how long have you had it? And, you know, I really want to say, like, I've had this for a year before I, mm -hmm. I sell it. But, you know, I've, I have one, uh, I, I bought a few and I lost a couple of them. Um, but one in particular is just doing awesome for me. Um, so I, it's on my website now. But, you know, yeah. I really wanted to make sure that, like, it look, it just, you know, they come in, they're pretty, they're pretty pale when they come in. And, like, yeah. they don't seem like they have a really good ability to capture food even like the polyps aren't particularly like they don't extend like they're just not a big polyp yeah and i think it, i think it has yeah. i think it, it probably has a lot to do with the transit time mm -hmm. um yeah you know they i just under, my understanding that that um you know if, if indo takes two days malaysian takes four or five days it's and longer then, or it's split. I think yeah. that the holding facilities are maybe questionable too. You know, I don't know how good the systems are where they're being held. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, they're a tricky coral for sure. I've definitely had a little bit of heartbreak and, you know, going into getting some, I, you know, I had the mindset that like, I'm probably going to lose a couple of them at least. Yeah. I mean, I mean, speaking of transit time, funny because we actually, so to diversify our stream of income, we actually distribute bait worms on the side mm -hmm. in the summer season. Yeah, and we go into the same issues too when we import the the, the big one, like the blood one. People use it for for fishing, mm -hmm. and and we import them from China when 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 Maine uh, is is on short supply, 
and uh, the transit time makes a huge difference mm-hmm. in, in transporting livestock in these like aquatic animals. So I imagine, you know, SPS straight from the wild. Um, if they don't know how to handle them, you know, it took a long time to get here. And, and you know, you don't know what the water condition is. Yeah. You can get, they carry a lot, a lot of stuff. You never know, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think um, like the Australians have a pretty good system for shipping. I've had some macros come from Australia that were like, you know, two days ish in transit. Yeah, and not they, they come in great. Tom Notch. Because they, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's the developed world. They kind of have a little better facilities. Like, you know, maybe the procedures yeah. of the packing are a little more sanitary and you know just uh, also they're not packing the corals in you know uh you know super super hot heat either right right? so yeah so i think there's there's reasons for that but uh yeah it's uh i don't know i mean yeah i'm I'm really glad we're seeing more of this malaysian coral come in because i mean people talk about the speciosa a lot but um some of the tenuous i got are just freaking awesome then i've seen some crazy ones Mm -hmm. we're sailing on a field we're sailing on a field right now yeah that, that, nice. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And it's coming pretty big size too. So, one thing yeah. I saw, I'll I'll post a link to the video. But in your worldwide corals uh, walkthrough video, it seems like you have a lot of different systems in the shop. So, like, how many actual completely different sets of water chemistry do you have to maintain? So, I think last I counted, we have fourteen different systems. Whoa! Separate. Yeah. <laughs> um good thing and, you have employees uh, <laughs> yeah i mean i have a good team in place we have at the most we have seven people working in the store and even uh, at, the, at the busiest day wow um you know doing packing and, and whatnot but um to manage that right it's interesting that you ask um in the beginning um i i i couldn't you know as a as an entrepreneur as an owner of somebody some some your own business i, I was hard for me to let go control I think mm-hmm. I see that in a lot of uh, hobbies because you, it's your, you know, it's your baby. You have a certain way, you develop a certain way of doing things, and you want to do everything that way. But that's not the way. That's not how it is in reefing, right? In reefing, there are different ways to achieve the same goal. You mm-hmm. know, you take two tanks, very successful, very beautiful tank. They're doing things completely different. Totally. So totally. one's phosphate is zero point two, one phosphate zero point zero three. But they grow aqua just just as yeah. before, you know. Because didn't you and, say in the video that uh, one you you were like, here's one system that I run the chemistry on, and here's another system that I don't touch, and another person runs it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I I I think because if I let the employees take 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 ownership of a tank, they have more of a. I mean, incentive. they're happy to begin with. You mm-hmm. know, they want to do things their own way. Yeah. And I think they 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 it's more fulfilling and also. It constantly learning, and you know when you let them do it do it their own way, the result always show. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I said I don't care how you do it, as long as corals grow and they look good, yeah. and and you know, and, and that, I I think, that's all I care. I think that's cool, know, so. and it's kind of an opportunity for you to both kind of learn because you might have some of the same corals in both of those tanks, and you can kind of see what you know what looks different or how they yeah differently. Like for example uh, my business partner will he likes his stuff clean right he can't stand the try mm-hmm. but me i'm i'm, I'm kind of like i just let that thing settle i never mm-hmm. touch it yeah so i don't i don't even run socks so if, if I, I show a video where if i stick my finger into the sump my 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 detritus is like up to here yeah crazy you know <laughs> yeah as long but as you don't that, stir that, that crap tank, up that tank also produces the most amount of frags in mm-hmm. the store mm-hmm. um all the colors it's great, you know. That that also tank that 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 makes like the Walt Disney look. Oh my God! Like mm-hmm. there's no other business like that. So again, different methodologies achieving the same results, and, and it's great. I, I learn a lot. I mean, we talk trash to each other sometimes, and and sometimes for me, you know, a lot. There's there's a lot of pride as a reefer, right? Mm-hmm. That's the way you're doing things, and then you wanna walk. You always wanna prove that you know my way is better than yours. Yeah, but. <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I've been humbled. I, I learned a lot from, from the guys and, and you know, and it's great, you know, especially, I actually, funny you mentioned, this week I, we just started a, a glow up contest among me and two other state heads, nice. like Chris, Sabella, yeah. And, yeah. and Will, us three, we're going to glow one of the glow and see who goes it. Yeah, That's, nice. You know, yeah, I'm trying to get Sabella on the, uh, I've been asking him since I started, so I got to get him on soon, but he works for you, he, right? You know, funny, like, he's interesting character because believe it or not nobody has seen his tank in person 
<laughs> I, I I've always hey let me go over take some take some picture beauty shop your tank you know post it you know and then he's like you know always like busy this busy that but we just theorize that maybe he's either hiding a dead body or he's yeah. like invested <laughs> with a taser he doesn't want to show people he's, he's plumbing or one I don't know. But, yeah. you know, well, but his stuff is great. His he can speak for himself if he comes on the podcast and we'll see what he says. <laughs> yeah, you got to get him to come yeah. on. Yeah. Maybe brought him, some, brought him to the field of your acros, you know. Is there anything specific you've learned from having differently run systems that, you know, you can kind of say, like, you know, it's like a, I don't know, giving you like a strong conclusion on something in particular? Um, it's, it, I, I think it's helped me to be humble. A lot more, more grounded into you know. You always somebody know. Doesn't matter how much you think you know that somebody has no more than you. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I, I've started to start look behind, look for reasons, signs behind behind the things that we do. Because back then, um, there's a lot of information on the internet, and then you try to look for ways to do things better. Yeah. And someone else has success with uh, with with, with skills, something you try, but you try it. But there's so many different variables associated with the success of the other ten. Mm-hmm. that it may not be suitable for your tank, right? Yeah. So, but, like, um, I'm curious, like, if there, you know, is a certain parameter you've seen kind of quite a bit different in one system from another that has kind of, like, you know, reflected on the health of the corals or the color or something like that? Anything that's been, been kind of out of the ordinary? So I, I I actually started running my alkaline a lot, a lot lower now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and this came from um, one of the tanks that Chris was running. Uh, uh-huh. You know, he was running a, a 10, 120 gallon. Um, the alkalinity was like 5.5. Whoa. Right? 5.4. Crazy. And then he, he he was doing two parts and he was basically sustaining uh, the alkalinity calcium when the two parts ran out because he's, he's, he was part time, right? So he doesn't come off the story part time. Yeah. So out of 14 systems, we kind of like let that one go. But but we still do want to change on that weekly. And then I'm going to low. But we look at, you know, the tank has PE, growth, everything. You know? So then we think, why would my alkaline so high? You know? Look at this tank, right? Mm-hmm. So then I, start, I started to level up my alkaline to like seven. And then I noticed that the core is generally, generally a lot like more, um, a lot tougher, for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. Because we, we stick our hand in the tank a lot and then we pull frags out, we ship, and then we, and then the water level go down, we have to top off, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of swings. And and but this I, I noticed that the, the the tank that has seven DKH, it, it, it just seems to ignore those changes. Yeah. Like, just shake it off like as if nothing happened. I mean, I guess it there's would make no... sense in some ways because I mean the ocean's like six point eight or somewhere in the in that range. Like, you know, right. th- my concern would have been with running a lower alkalinity is if you do have a downward swing, you don't have as much like space until you hit five. Like where is if you're at 8.5 and you drop two, you know, it's not as so, bad, but. So if you have a downward, if, if you're, if you take, say your, your alkalinity is six, right. And mm-hmm. then you, and then you have a drop. Uh, that means we messed up. Um, because usually we should check out calcium reactor to make sure the CO2 tank is full. Mm-hmm. And then the only thing, the only time that's happened, we took a took a dip is when the CO2 tank was empty. So we took it, uh, made a, a routine check, make sure that you know from time to time we, we take we do like a walkthrough of the entire store, make sure our CO2 tank is full. And and I I, I feel like to me right when I see when I look at the corals and I look at the number, it's kind of like. As if like someone is like a like a like a rope like a, some and someone is putting a putting a finger on it right mm-hmm. that's when you consume yeah. it yeah that's why it looks like it's low right because say if 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 you took away all the coral mm-hmm. right the water your your alkaline pile would hit eight or mm-hmm. nine right? yeah yeah if you kept but dosing because you have all these corals rate. consuming it's as if someone putting a a push downward pressure on the on the on mm-hmm. the number mm-hmm. that's why it's filling up five six. So that tells me that the corals are actively consuming and actively growing. Mm-hmm. That's a good sign. What I what I'm concerned, I do get concerned when the when it spikes. That means the coral stop consuming. So something they stressed out. If they're not taking in calcium alkalinity, they's not growing. Yeah. So they probably stressed out, try to cope with something else. You know. So that's why I look for issues. Mm-hmm. 
so I guess uh, speaking of, um, you know, how you run these systems, you said calcium reactor. What is kind of your main go-to for your major element supply? Huh. Yeah, so, so in the last, okay, so prior to, um, I've always maintained that, that you should have as many fish as you can in the system. So when I, in the beginning, when I was selling out of the basement, I, I, I got one of those, um, those uh, botanic, uh, those tubs. It was like four by four by 12 inch, which measures about 60 gallons. Mm -hmm. So they're like literally a six inch tall and four by four, 60 gallons. And I put, uh, I had 10 yellow tank in there. 10 yellow tank, not just yellow tank. And, and I mean, obviously they took out all the algae, but I always felt like something they are eating and when they poop, when they produce waste, that goes to coral. Mm -hmm. Because if you, so that we walk away from reefing and to pay attention to like other other areas of the news. Uh, I noticed that there's an article when they say, you know, reef suffering because this place is in, in overfished, right? Mm -hmm. So fish has something to do with like they say the larger predator indicate health of um of the reef. But I, I started doing more research into it, and uh, I want to see what what is it that you know fish is con con contributing to 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 the corals, right? In the earlier days, you know, it's all anecdotal, no science behind it. People say, oh, I, my core is a pair. What should I do? And a lot of advice, people say, add more fish, right? Mm -hmm. And then why? Why do you want to add more fish? Oh, the fish poop. So then, okay, so what is it that's in fish poop that's producing all this? So I, I, I found out, I actually had a paper, I read a paper, not open access though, but they actually did a study on about 400 different individual fish. Mm -hmm. And they took all the excrement, yeah, and took a dry weight and then examined, and then found that all this micronutrient, like zinc, like uh, potassium, mm. like you know, the stuff that we're literally dosing. Yeah, like the know, trace, uh, basically trace elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So prior to, I think prior to um, last year, I my my thing is just like, okay, I have an issue, and more fish. Yeah. Right. And more fish, and then. That's that's pretty much the theme of the store in the beginning. It's just that the the the, the, the estate tank that that did really well had a lot of fish in there. Yeah. But now I know why because one thing that stood out particularly is that they step, they actually identify the species of the fish that has the most fat fatty acid or like heavy on lipid, mm -hmm. heavy on uh, 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 you know manganese. I'm like, these are stuff that we're dosing in the Wee Moonshine uh, yeah. program, right? Yeah. It's just that we're able to identify exactly how precise we want to dose it, but we have these fish that are actually supplement in it. Yeah. So kind of, kind of, kind of, the dot kind of connected for me. Yeah. Well, so, and I, my, my thought on that, sorry to um, interrupt a little, um, is that the other part of it is that this is coming out of, you know, the digestive tract of the fish, and therefore it's, you know, basically infused with bacteria as well along with ammonia and these are kind of the things that we know corals consume ammonia we know they consume bacteria and we know that yes. they need trace elements so maybe it's partly it's like a very good delivery system for the nutrients and the trace elements to get to the coral I think, I, yeah i think that's how nature intended it to be like right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so uh, i think i'm kind of like going through a little bit but i i i, I that's why like in the i actually just started um finally I jumped on a bandwagon uh, of moon, Moonshiner, and mm -hmm. then I started dosing a few, uh, testing out on two of the tank at the store. Yeah. So um, I want to see how that's gonna how that's gonna go. Yeah. So up until this point, you haven't really done any particular trace element system. You kind of just you get the trace elements from the water changes you're doing and whatever you're feeding, pretty much. Yeah, the most successful tank is still on, still not being dosed anything. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I actually attributed to. Uh, the, the, the heavy removal of water during bagging and shipping because I have to replenish it. So it almost come down to like almost like, a, 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 you know, for well, three days in a row, we're doing daily fish uh, water chain. Mm -hmm. And then we and then we have another schedule, 20% uh, water chain on the tank. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. I have a lot of fish. And uh, I, that's the heavy to try to, to try to that tank. Yeah. That tank is the like... You said 20% water change is this uh, bi-monthly or how often? Weekly. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that would make sense then because that way you're getting pretty good refresher of of uh, trace. What uh, salt are you guys using? It's an ocean. Yeah. Okay. The purple box. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of nice. I mean, I like uh, I like the simplicity of this because you're using instant ocean. 
you you kind of only just started trying moonshiners but i mean your corals look amazing and you grow a lot of coral you get great color so um the instant ocean are you doing anything to it before water changes or are you just using it exactly how it is no so yeah. adam you gotta remember so for our scale and when you when you're doing it for business uh, the, the goal is to keep things as simple as possible and cheap, yeah. as cheap as possible mm-hmm. and the thing that that helped me you know trust me so because they they use it for a uh, public aquarium and like their dolphin and their uh, you know those high value livestock mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and it, it can be you know very stable mm-hmm. that's what i'm looking for i don't want something that you know coming different badger coming different parameters so stable so i have a working baseline that I know what to do if something is, you know, missing. Mm-hmm. And it's also cheap, you know, and, and I think it's the, one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest uh, option for us. And with, in the beginning, the, the philosophy was, that, okay, well, I might have employees coming in to touch these tanks. If I'm, I'm going to have, have, have a dosing regimen on this tank, then I make sure that they, they know what they're dosing and dosing the right amount. Mm-hmm. Or if I put in a, a, a dosing pump on it, then they got to understand how to, uh, you know, identify errors. So there's too many moving parts. Mm-hmm. So I want to eliminate all of those and keep them as simple as possible. Yeah, and also like Instant Ocean is so accessible to the public that you know people can always get it. So you yeah, know, if they want to copy what you're doing, it's it's not like hard to attain. It's like you know I'm not going to name any certain salt brands, but I know there's some that people are pretty religious about using. But then there's periods of time where they can't get it. You know, so what are you supposed right. to do, right? Like, yeah, you know. And they they they're very expensive too. Mm-hmm. So when you try to do it in value, it becomes you know you can see a difference. So that's why we stick with the instant ocean. You know, yeah. Okay. Economical. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. It's uh yeah. it's nice to nice to see that that works because I guess uh, reef crystals is is the same um you know brand but different different um uh, parameters. Um is is there a reason you don't use reef crystals? Is it alkalinity too high or? Yeah. Aside from the cost, uh, yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to make sure it's a little higher. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes in the um we we the way where we have a spike in alkalinity, you know, to, we try to do bigger water change to bring it down. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one of the ways we try to bring that alkalinity. Yeah. So if we have a high out salt, then we can't really do that. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I think maybe we got a bit crisscrossed on the last question because um, I was trying to, which was great. We basically talked about nutrients, but um, <laughs> uh, the uh, major elements. So how do you supply? Is it calcium reactors, two-part? Um, like what's your kind of go-to? Do you use calc? My personal go-to is calcium reactor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once that, uh, once the corals start to, you know, can keep, well, then I start to dose uh, a calc water on dosing pump. Yeah. Okay. Do you do the calc like uh, reverse schedule or just at night or all day? It... Yeah. I do it all day, and then I do it like every every hour. I program it to Apex, mm-hmm. and then every hour, and then I just follow along. Check. I make sure my numbers on point. Yeah. And then. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's nice because I mean, calcium reactor is such a steady feed of of um, calcium carb carbonate, I guess, um, and then. You know, you can kind of play with the fine tuning a little bit with the calc, right? Yeah, and the calc also one reason I went with that, in addition to have an additional uh, calcium uh, uh, storage, is uh, because when we have a lot of people in the store, believe it or not, we have a very small space, thousand mm-hmm. square feet. Yeah. So it's very very tight space, and then CO two level is crazy in the store, and then you can actually see on the chart on the the pH in the water actually drop. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, I mean, one way to, to counter that is, is to use those uh, you know, calcium hydroxide calc yeah. after, and uh, to help with the pH. Yeah, yeah, that would make more sense for doing it in the day. Uh, one of my systems that runs calcium reactor, I only run the calc at night on that system, um, just to kind mm-hmm. of have less of a pH swing, I guess. But um, but it kind of makes sense if you got people coming in and breathing all day, especially if you got seven employees. Sometimes that's enough to make a difference, right? Yeah, it's very, you know, believe it or not, they are very sensitive to the CO2 in the water. It, it's so sensitive that whatever that's in the wa- in the air gets absorbed in the water. Mm-hmm. I think the chemistry just like works so perfectly, you know, the ions and everything. Um, yeah. Are you so. open every day? Like, is the shop open um, every day? So we, we work every day. Yeah. Uh, it's open for working every day. And we open for public um, Thursday to Sunday. Mm-hmm. And then we reserve Monday 
to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for shipping and maintenance. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that makes so sense. Have to have a I was just, I was just curious on uh, busy days with customers versus uh, days where it's just the staff working. You probably see a difference in in pH. I'm imagining, hey. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. When there's one person, two person, you can definitely see. But yeah. when we when we go to a, a swap, we just came back from Fred Farmer, so mm -hmm. we took the uh, took the whole team there. And then the one in the store, you can see the pH. Yeah, you're just like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Yeah, yeah that's, no. that's funny. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it kind of works out because, um, you know, that's during the daytime hours. So you can afford for the pH to be dropped a little during the day, whereas nobody's like, the shop's not full of people at night. So <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so as far as like products, um, I'm going to guess you don't, you're not dosing anything particularly fancy. Is there anything that you're kind of religious about as far as dosing any like aminos or any products like that? Um, I used to, I used to dose amino. Um, mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, I did not really see any effect the amino. Yeah. You know what I used to dose? I used to dose a uh, flatworm stock from uh, Colin, Colin, uh, KZ. Yeah. And it gave me, gave me a crazy PE, you know? I don't know what they had in there. But it was too expensive. Yeah, it is expensive. Uh, to, I to, dose to, it, to, but not a ton. Yeah. And we actually had yeah. that. It's, <laughs> it's too it's... much. So, so we stopped. Yeah, yeah no, expensive. you couldn't do that on a commercial level. And, you know, one of the things about that product is it's mostly potassium and iodine and a few trace elements and then whatever the sort of botanical kind of part is, you know, that may just be a carbon source at the end of the day, you know, so... Right, um, you know, I'm. I'm yeah, I'm, I don't know. I don't know yeah. what it's. That's a problem, right? I mean, crazy. Like the the zero bit method, I tried it. It worked mm -hmm. like in, like literally overnight. You can see uh, color change. Mm -hmm. But the problem was that it, it, it's so um, you can't make any error. You gotta be perfect all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it was fun if you were one of those type of person. You leave a lifestyle where you can, yeah. Be, uh, you know, you don't go out. You don't go on vacation. You know, it was fun for. For a short period of time, but once you realize you have a life outside of these things, yeah, then then yeah, your your thing comes crashing down. It's pretty uh, intense. I mean, so, anything you got to do a few drops of this and a half a mil of that and everything every day. That's uh, yeah. you know, that's a pretty big commitment as far as a hobby. You know, <laughs> so. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to sell anybody, but like with with all these with the with the zero bit, you didn't know what it was in it. It could be a combination of chase elements. Mm -hmm. You don't know, so you yeah. can't really. Uh, 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 advanced as a, in terms of knowledge as a hobbyist, but with the with the moonshot and the, and with other like you know, other methods these days, where you're dosing specific trace elements yeah. into the water, yeah. you know exactly where you're dosing and nothing else. So totally. if anything goes off, you know where to look for answers and, and, and support. Yeah, so I kind of like that aspect of it. You know, I can I can validate the science behind it if I did my research. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been a thing that's always bugged me about KZ, and I don't really mind talking about them in this way because I've reached out to them and they never get back to me, so it's not like they're probably listening. But uh, yeah, I think it's like it's come to a point where I would like a company like that to be more transparent because it's not giving us the opportunity to really learn very much. We just know that like, oh, this bottle has a blend of trace elements. Like, which trace elements? Why did those trace elements? help or did i dose this product that had potassium and this one had potassium and all of a sudden my potassium is really high but i didn't know that because they didn't say it had potassium in it you know <laughs> right exactly yeah there's yeah. no discussion between we first you know oh what are you doing i'm doing this oh but this happened why is that i don't know yeah i don't know because yeah i, I don't know if it's that or something else i don't know like you can't find answers <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, the moonshiners and all, any of the sort of ICP based trace element systems, they um, they do give you an ability to learn. Um, but it's it's still pretty. I would say it's 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 a fine detailed thing. Like even Andre from Reef Moonshiners says that it's all the elements and the way they interact with each other that really make the system work. It's not you know, he couldn't say like this is the most important trace element nickel or something you know it, he's going to tell you it's all of them right. and and it's it's not like an ignorant thing it's it, it there's a reason because all these elements have you know an ionic sort of balance between each other and they probably support and buffer each other in a certain way right 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 that's yeah. that, i think that's why um, um it's, it's important to to not take anybody's word you know you got to do your own research i guess it comes down to critical thinking about you know 
what the information that you see, right? You know, there's so much information out there. What are you listening to? Mm-hmm. And 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 it, that's why I start thinking of all these all these science research the articles, and then and then it, it's it's like it's so amazing that what they talk about kind of validates some of the things that the program says. And then like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm not a scientist by trade, so. I'm still, you know, feeling my way around the program, everything. Mm-hmm. It's, it's too early for me to even say that it works or not. But on paper, it makes sense. Um, so I want to see, you know. Yeah, it'd be a, interesting more. to see the systems you're doing the Moonshiners with in six months and see if you really see a big difference. Because, I mean, you're already at a pretty good starting point for, for color and growth anyways. Yeah, right? that's why I'm, yeah, that's why I'm documenting it, too, in mm-hmm. that grow all contest I had with the guys. Because... They they don't run moonshiner on their system. Mm-hmm. Um, only only the tank that I'm putting the contest piece in runs moonshiner. Mm-hmm. So I want to see if, if that will give it an edge. Yeah, you know? yeah, that extra like five or ten percent. Who knows, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So uh, I guess another thing is uh, bacteria. Um, do you dose any bacteria, or do you kind of? I mean, you were talking about adding live rock from good established systems. That kind of got your system kind of. You know, really starting to work well, uh, but do you do any dosing of bacteria, any kind of thing in that range? I I, I do dose bacteria in the beginning uh, when I set up a tank. I, I I kind of do believe in it, whether or not it, it's it's if the bottle's empty or, or you know devoid of bacteria or not. Because and when I it this brings me back for my uh, to my first tank ever, right? When I first set up a tank, um, it was super cloudy, like my first first ever tank ever in, back in the day. Mm-hmm. So I went to buy, um, not anyone, but I went to another hobby. I bought all his live rock. He broke down. It was a 90 gallon. I had a 90 gallon. Yeah. I, I think my salt mix, I started, the, it was a like milky. And I don't know why. I the salt was I didn't completely uh, uh, mix it up well, but it was cloudy for days. Weird. So, mm. And then I went to buy live rock. I dumped the live rock in there. The next day, the entire town was cleared up. Mm. I did nothing else, just the live rock. Yeah. So I felt like either there's a bacterial bloom and then the lyra provides surface area for the bacteria to live mm-hmm. on so they're no longer waterborne or there's organic uh, bat- particulates or whatever it's in the water column where the bacteria attach to and weigh them down. Yeah. So something with something with the established bio rock that clear up the tank for me. Yeah. Well, that kind of breaks the uh, what's the saying is nothing good happens fast in a reef tank. That's a, a, a case against. <laughs> so, you know, you have the rock and what you say yeah. day later. I, I try to yeah. replicate that, but I, I realize you have to have a substantial amount of live rock. If you dump a few mm-hmm. pieces in there, it's not doing anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you start a tank brand new and it was cloudy. You start with salt mix and then you bring in established live rock. Yeah, and, and it will clear your tank. Yeah, something I did recently was I brought in a box of Fiji rock for a customer, and I was just like, "Hey, can I pay you, you know, like a, a, a quarter of this box and take a quarter of it and just put it in my sump?" Because I was like, "That's like the best bacteria you can get in your tank, right? It's like straight from yeah. from Fiji." So I, I I don't know if it did anything. I think I think things look better, <laughs> but yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I, I think I think the 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 hobby is slowly moving back to the live rock. And then, you know, dry rock still has its place, but everyone yeah. understands now, you know, there's a battle to be fought when you start out with dry rock. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's kind of comes down to one of the things, you know, we were talking about with, you know, everyone that has a style of reefing kind of has a brand, essentially. And it's kind of like their stuff kind of looks kind of this way. And like, there's like a, you know, just a way that certain colors come out in a certain way for them. And I think a lot of that has to do with the bacterial composition of the system, because that's the thing that's going to be one of the most different things from tank to tank. I mean, trace elements are going to be different too, but I think the bacterial composition is going to be one of the biggest differences. Yeah, for sure. I, I think the hobby always, you know, talk about, you know, they know that bacteria is required, but I, I think uh, the emphasis was not, you know, placed more on the bacteria than it is now. I think it's great that we talk about, but there's still so much more for, for us to learn. Uh, mm-hmm. um, we, we're just taking the word of like, you know, um, you know, based on experience, uh, based on what the what the manufacturer tell us, but I, I wish there's more. I think the Mac, the the Mac, um, the, um, the company, right? Uh, the Aquabiomics. 
Hyperbiomics, yeah. what they're doing, great. I, I, I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. Um, but I, I've been to look into it more when, when, when the time, you know. Yeah, um, I just so, sent a big, um, a big list of notes, discussion notes to Eli. So I'm going to try to book him on here soon because I got so many questions for him. <laughs> but sure, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so that should be interesting. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I think, you know, for anybody struggling with a new system, if, if you can get some live rock from a really good, solid reefer, that you know can just spare you know five or five pounds or something it's you know it's sharing that that bacterial um diversity is is huge yeah for sure. yeah, yeah. You, especially if you don't have patience you wait it out um you know when in the store um the the, the, the latest the, the most recent tank that was set up is a few hundred gallon that chris is currently taking care of and we were able to act forward like within a week because we, oh, were, wow. we, were, cy- we were cycling while we knew leading up to it we knew we were going to use the uh, live rock. So we mm-hmm. had a tub to stop in, cycling the live rock on the side. Yeah. And then um, we had no problem. We didn't have any algae. Really? Happening. Yeah. Yeah, because so, I usually um, find there's like, no matter what, there's always a bit of a cycle on the glass and any new surfaces because there's no biofilms there. But you're saying you've had a tank just not even skip a beat, just straight, straight to established? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we... Yeah. That's what we did. Yeah, we we did we did live sand, and then uh, we, I mean, not that we didn't do anything, right? We did the water change in the middle, and then we made sure that you know we did our tests, make sure there's no ammonia, make sure the cycle is gone, or there's no whether or not it's going through a cycle. Mm-hmm. We did all those tests in the beginning, and then we had calls. But my understanding is that for calls such a lower life form, it's different from fish. You know, um, I I feel like you can add calls earlier than you can add fish in a newly cycle. Totally. Yeah, I think it really like kicks the biology of a system into into gear if you can just throw some kind of like I don't know some big ugly corals in just to get it going. You know, you can always yeah, take exactly. them out and replace and them. And whatever that comes with coral can also you know see your tank, see your rock with that kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention, I mean, you know, I think one thing we're starting to learn a little bit more about. Um, you know, to do with coral microbiome and the fact that there's bacteria on the tissue of all of our corals. So, you know, does some of that bacteria have use outside of the coral on the tank on the surfaces? I, I'm pretty sure it's all part of the same, you know, essentially the, the same organism as far as our system. Yeah, those, go. those those are your friends. I mean, if anything, if you think about the stuff we're dosing now, the tissue element, they're not for the coral. They're actually uh, 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 for the. the the, micro, the, the microbiome that, that's living the symbionts of the coral, they are the ones that are taking up all the trace RNA mm-hmm. So yeah. in, 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 in effect, your, your corals are the ones that benefit from it. If they're happy, it's like your gut health, right? If your bacteria totally. is ha- happy, your corals are going to be happy, right? So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's why I, I, I think um, it's important, you know, the, the bacteria is definitely mm-hmm. important. And, you know, so in the beginning, I those, but right now, once the tank gets going, I, I don't dose any bacteria. And yeah. I feel like a healthy tank. You sh- if you have to continuously dose bacteria, then then you know if there's something wrong there. Yeah, and that again, I, I think some people just will do it because you know the instructions tell them to. But I mean, um, yeah, it was when I had Lou Lou Eckes on. He's like, bacteria. It's is the best thing on the planet at multiplying. You know, its job is to multiply. You know, right. Well, yeah. I don't know. Maybe viruses multiply. I mean, I'm sure there's other, you know, things that multiply fast. But bacteria is really good at multiplying. So, you know, if exactly. the environment is is conducive of 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 that happening, then you know, the hopefully, I mean, that's the thing about the composition of bacteria is you want the good ones to proliferate, and you kind of want the bad yeah. ones to to go away. So, I guess that leads me to the next question: Is do you ever run any antibiotics? Like, what's your kind of stance on that? Because it's a bit of a, like, I'd say a hot topic right now. Uh, no, I don't. I no. don't. I don't use it. I don't because again, I I believe in the beneficial bacteria in the tank. Yeah. I feel like without understanding what exactly the the antibiotic targeting, I can't find. I can't see myself dosing that into it because yeah. it's like discriminate uh, uh, targeting in the tank. So if there's issues, I'd rather find other ways to uh, to um, to address it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One, one, it, one, one thing I found is by lowering the temperature also, because I think lower temperature actually, uh, you know, it, it, it's been known, well, well, well known that it reduces metabolism mm-hmm. in the organism, including bacteria, so they trip it through less. And um, I think that helps with the, with the health of the coral. So overall. what's the kind of range you run the systems in then? Or what ideally? Um, all right. I mean, having said that, uh, we don't go for any specific numbers. Uh, mm-hmm. We try to keep it consistent. If a 10 runs a 78, we try to keep a 78. 
Mm-hmm. The tank had been running at 76. Um, because we put our hand in so much that if he was out of whack, we know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it's come to that point where we, we, we you know, we, we try, try not to stress ourselves over like all the tank in the room. Because again, the, the way our store is set up is that there's a draft that mm-hmm. comes in. So the, the front of the store is usually colder and back of the store is even, even hotter. So we just kind of let it fall into a boundary where it can sustain comfortably, then we let it be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you use any like air exchange kind of units or you probably have some some air conditioning in there for the summer? We do. We do. Yeah. So funny they mentioned that in the beginning, we, you know, again, we didn't know what we we're doing, right? We're in the store, try to put the tank in there. Oh, there's central AC. Great. But uh, our neighbor, the business next to it is a salon, right? Mm-hmm. And then they, they do a lot of hair washing and whatnot. They come from here. You guys don't have an exhaust? Like, mm-hmm. No. Or you need one, oh, it's going to be a, a rainforest in here, you know, mm-hmm. with all the water you want. <laughs> so, yeah. like, last minute, it was, it was totally out of budget. We didn't allocate the money for it, but we realized, you know, we don't do it now. We we, we, we can't, you know, we got to do it right now because you got to get the ceiling. So, we put in, like, those uh, restaurant e- uh, exhaust mm-hmm. and That's we hooked expensive. it up to a, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we hooked it up to a humidity mm-hmm. uh, a monitor. Mm-hmm. And then the humidity monitor would t- uh, monitor the humidity in the store once it gets a certain, certain percentage. It would kick the fan on, um, so that's 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 the exhaust that we had. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, uh, the joys of uh, setting up a business. Hey, when there's some big expense you didn't account for, <laughs> it's a learning experience. It's yeah. a learning process. Every mm-hmm. step is a learning process. We have yeah. no, all we knew is that we like coral. Mm-hmm. We want to sell coral, but everything else we just learn. Yeah. yeah. No. Hey. Well, I hope I get to visit someday. I'm. I, uh, if I, I, I've never been to New York, so um, you know. Uh, yeah, you're on the, on the other side. Yeah, outside, yeah, I'm pretty far, but one of these well, days. You're close to California, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, somewhere. yeah. I'm close to Seattle. That's kind of where where I'm at. We're we, we're right right we're neighbors, but uh, yeah. You so visited uh, California, uh, like LA, the wholesale, the wholesaler, the seller there. There's a lot there's a of lot stores, but... there's a lot of seems like a lot of that in in LA for sure. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, you know Western Canada, so um, I'm in the north. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to ask you about lighting. Um, I noticed in the video, you're running a lot of radions from the looks of things. Is that kind of your primary go-to light? Yeah, I think, I think radio has come a long way uh, despite the software, uh, bugs. Um, but I think the light can grow calls for us. It's been proven and we're pretty happy with it. Yeah. Um, it, 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 the only, the only issue is I, I think it's not their fault. It's just the nature of the light. Um, is that uh, sometimes we find ourselves needing extra coverage. Uh, mm-hmm. So we usually put a strip light. This, yeah. this is especially problematic when we try to take photos of calls. And um, sometimes, you know, for example, your light source stand in the middle of the tank, you have a three, three foot, four foot tank. And usually the coral that you want to take a picture of is next to close to the side. So the light source coming from behind the coral. Mm-hmm. So your coral, your shot comes out dark. Yeah, it's, so it's like basically not being lit evenly from side to side kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah. So we we'll put a strip light, reef light. Yeah. Uh, like we actually have uh, the reef, one of the reef light uh, guy come in and custom build a rack that sits on the side of the fiberglass tub. Nice. That's, that we can mount the reef, uh, reef light on. So the reef light literally just literally on surface level, beaming at the surface of the water. We can take give it the extra light when you take photo. And yeah. of course, love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, and I noticed also your lights are hung pretty high. So, like four feet or so in some cases, it looked like three or four feet. Yeah. To some of the systems. Well, the top is 12 inches tall, the top that we use. Yeah. And, and all the cores are on the same level, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So they're like three inches, you know, sometimes you know, they go tall, they're like literally one inch on the surface of the water. So we're trying to raise it up so we spread out the light a little bit yeah. more evenly on them. But on the display tanks, we have them lower. Uh, one of the display tanks has to be a strand, HR strand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, it, it all depends on on the, the setup. On display tank, we hang them higher. No, I mean, I mean, they hang, I hang them hang them lower, mm-hmm. and then on the top we hang them real high. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I mean, it's like I, it, there is that advantage of if a light's like a, a light that has good diffusion, like the uh, G five G six radions, like it's going to have yeah. better distribution. The par will go down as you lower it up at surface level, but you're going to get better spreader distribution. So you yeah. get less. You know, I, I, dark I spots. think the par and the lighting is probably a little bit, um, for lack of a better word, I think overrated mm-hmm. for two reasons, I agree. right? One, I don't own a par meter, reason, by the way. 
I have refused to own one. It's not like I can't afford one. It's that I don't want to But, you know, if you see an event like yourself, you can tell if the corals yeah. are getting enough light or not. But um, I actually have the opportunity to go diving in Tahiti mm -hmm. uh, on my honeymoon. Cool. And then, and then I was able to see um, how deep the aqua was growing. Mm -hmm. And they were deeper than I imagined. I mean, they, they were like, when you get down there, it's all blue. So I think what, what Jason, Jason Fox uh, mm -hmm. said in one of the Magnus speech where he said he went diving and see all echoes is blue. They're so mm -hmm. deep, this is blue. So they were able to live in, in that type of depth. <clears throat> the only thing that that were like within probably six feet of water is clams. Mm -hmm. So excuse me. So clams, I, I don't see clams, I'll probably be down like 12 feet, 20 feet of water they start to really like become scared, you know, mm -hmm. but like 60 feet, 80 feet, I would still see table and aqua, like the highest thing this, really? yeah. that type of aqua is going like, you know. Yeah, there. that's pretty so, deep. And like, if you know, yeah. I don't know if you, you, do you dive? I'm certified, but I don't want to say I dive because I haven't dove yeah. so long. Yeah. I did my diving in uh, 2019 in uh, um, Thailand and, and yeah, it's true. Like some of the aquapora are, you know, pretty deep. It, it, I wouldn't say it's dark because your perspective is a little different because your eyes adjust when you're down there. But I have no idea what the par would be at, you know, um, you know, 10 meters or 30 feet or something like that um, compared yeah, yeah. to, you know, our tanks. But like, do you measure par much? Like, do you, would you kind of give a rough range of like what you keep acros in versus, you know, you feel I, I don't measure like it to I don't measure it to solve problems. I measure for fun sometimes. Yeah. Like if I had a. Sometimes I had a debate with one of my guys. Hey, I think you need more light. Oh, yeah, you think so? Mm -hmm. Let me see, you know. Or, or, or oh, no, maybe you're right, you know. Uh, for ex yeah, yeah, actually, true that that. This is why you have 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 uh, open open discussion with with uh, employees because they sometimes provide a different perspective. You know, they're like, "Oh, your light's kind of dim." I'm like, "Doesn't seem like it to me." Yeah. But then my call is do like kind of dark over here. I don't know. I don't know why my, my thing's cranked up. So then I, that's when I took the partner out and then take a look. But see someone else actually tell, you know, tells me that you're 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 not getting enough light. Where you to look at the tent every day, all day, you are used to that intensity. Mm -hmm. You think totally. you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get used to it. Um, yeah, and it's then good, it's a good tool to have, though. It's good tool to have, but yeah. You know, it, if you have like 200 par and then your echo is doing great, there's no need to fix it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's funny. Like I, I had a customer that was asking me today for some par numbers and, you know, I gave him ranges. I said, you know, 250 to 300 for this piece or, you know, like this piece is more accepting. So I gave a range on one that was like 250 to 450 because it's right. a coral that just kind of almost looks the same. So why, why waste the high par on it? Yeah. Um, but he wanted numbers and I'm just like, dude, the numbers are not what matter it's it's the range and then you put the coral in that range and right. if you feel like it needs to come up like move it up a little bit or move it down like but be open to you know to making a change if you have to right, because right. it's like the number the coral does not care about the number <laughs> and <laughs> also all. also they have to understand that you have a milli that will love 500 par but then you have an ignata that can't take that kind of par right yeah. so just because you you have that part, you have to be strategic with where you place. You gotta understand what type of core you you, you have, and you gotta know where to put them. Otherwise, for example, yeah. like like the dragons, the uh, 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 some of the smooth skin, you know, um, they can't do that part. Yeah, but and that's kind of obvious. Out. Like you know, I mean, I think that even a fairly beginner hobbyist is gonna kind of know the difference between a deep water acro and a shallow water acro. And, you know, you can tell from the smooth skin and it's just a general yeah. rule. Like if it's got smooth skin, like start it yeah. low, it can probably sell them. Yeah. There are exceptions to that rule too. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that uh, some of my smooth skin, especially granulosa, yeah. it can take a lot more light than you, than you would think. Yeah. And, and you have some awesome granulosas I've seen too. That's they're, they're really cool coral when you find those really like multicolor morphs. Yeah. I mean, they, they really bring out the color when you hit it with a lot of light. So, um, they, they come. They, they may look unassuming if you remove a weight, if you remove the intensity of the light. But mm -hmm. when you hit it with intense light, um, it's really you know it's really 
call it full. So yeah. what would you say is like the peak you would give? Like millies, I feel like can handle like 800 par if if you you know if they get acclimatized to it. Like what yeah, would you millies say is can your... give them the sunlight. They, they, I have not seen millies suffer from uh, mm -hmm. much light, um, but I, I know that the the the, the wheat wrap um, RRC uh, Hellfire Granada mm -hmm. definitely cannot take so much light. Uh, yeah, totally. So yeah. that's one. That's that's one that that. That's out the most, what what would be kind fire. of your general range for, you know, say a milli versus a tenuous versus, you know, something like an Echinata or something? So milli and tenuous, I I generally put them high up. I give them as much light as possible. Yeah. Just because I feel like I need the intensity to bring out the color. Um, oh, uh, the color of the light is also important as well. Mm -hmm. um, not just like intense light, but also intense blue light. I find that 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 especially tenuous, it will, will will bring out the color that you look for in the pictures. Yeah, would be high intensity blue light. Um, so what for example, the the strip light of Rebrite that I have that I mounted on the side of the tub, mm -hmm. breaking it down. If I put tenuous, literally like inches away from it, they love it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the polyps, the color come out really great. Uh, Millies. Like there's a milli that just like I, I I've been trying to bring out a color. I don't know what I literally put that thing like up right at the surface of the water mm -hmm. and it hasn't done much for me yet. So it's it's interesting, you know. It's one of the reasons why I started looking at um moonshine also because I realized there's a few corals that bring me some challenges and struggle. I want to see something that I'm missing. Yeah. So that's why I kinda of try that. Well, well, I mean, um, yeah, and it could be something you're missing or it could be too much of something too. Like um, you know, I've seen acros get dark from high iodine. So if for any reason you've got high iodine, that can be an issue. Or if you have an imbalance of fluoride and iodine. Um, but one thing I will say that I've learned from, you know, all of this trace element ICP stuff is that fluoride is actually a really important element to pay attention to. Like if I was gonna say out of all the ones that I've kind of like started adding and dosing like fluoride, I would probably say I noticed the biggest difference. Yeah, I, I, I've been hearing that. I've been mm -hmm. hearing that. Um, like, it, 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 it's interesting. Like, it's like a one that when I do a correction dose, it's the one that tells you go the most. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's here's like, the thing, though. Here's you know, I'm like, oh my god, this is like I can't. I can use big syringes, and, and I'm dosing so much, and it still says, you know, next ICP still says I'm low. I'm like, yeah. Like, well, that but that shows you it's being used. But um, the funny thing is, um, I would say. I mean, sure, it's great to get a reading on an ICP, but if you have enough of an eye for it, you can tell what your floor, well, not an exact level, but you can tell your fluoride level from looking at your corals because I noticed really? especially. What, what, are we, what are we be looking for? So any tenuous that has a blue tip, the tips will get bluer and it'll happen fairly quickly because like my home wreckers, like the tips are like deep, dark, royal, like nice, dark blue now. And when mm -hmm. my fluoride reading was below natural seawater, they, they didn't look that great. Oh. Like they had a growth tip, but the growth tip didn't have that deep blue pigment in it. And when I got the level up, purple, it was, right? yeah, yeah. And it was now, and, and I can tell that my fluoride level is good because if those start to fade a little bit, I'll go, okay, I think the fluoride's probably dropped a little bit and I can dose more. And I can, I've, I've even seen it in like, I'd say a, a day or two since bringing the level up. So, um, Oh, yeah. okay. Very interesting. How often do you do ICB tests right now? Um, I do. I've been doing them once a month recently. Um, but part of that is to learn, and I would like to not have to do it once a month. I would pr preferably just do it, you know, every two or three months. But um, you know, for now, I mean, it's just it's kind of cool to see what kind of impact things are having on the system. Um, mm -hmm. but that said, like, like, and I'm not doing moonshiners. I'm mostly on the fauna mar marine system. But, it, you know, it's similar in theory as far as, like, yes. you know, you're adjusting the trace elements based on the ICPs. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's, like, night and day or anything. It hasn't, like, changed right. my whole world of reefing. Because if I look at photos of some of my corals from three years ago, I'm kind of like, ooh, I haven't, that one actually hasn't looked as good since that photo, <laughs> you know? So whatever else I was doing differently, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's me. That's that's SPS for you. Yeah. Yeah, but um, <laughs> as far as um, back to the lighting a little bit, um, I'm always curious what people's peak period is with their radion schedule, or if they have a programmed, you know, LED schedule. Like, oh. how long would you say your peak period is? Um, not that long. Probably three three hours. Yeah. Three hours. Um, 
this this stem from the beginning when we opened the store was thinking was that um we try to kind of, i think the customers come in during later in the day so we don't want to have the date like go too long and then for a store blue lights out coral right so mm-hmm. then we bring in the blue light uh very early on so uh i think right now though uh, a couple of tanks that have not been uh, handled by me um they run a little longer mm-hmm. um, um i don't yeah i i think i think it's uh I, I, I think the longer, the better. Right now, I actually don't think we run long enough. To be honest, I'm gonna have to look into it. Well, it's interesting because when you think about like when we used to run metal halides and T5s and whatnot, like that light was just on, and then it was on all for what eight, yes. ten hours. Yes. Like it, 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 there was no ramp up or anything. So, um, yeah, I've actually. I mean, I know um, Worldwide Corals is kind of kind of pushed for, especially for their LPS kind of systems, is like a four hour peak period is kind of your uh, like optimal in terms of what the coral can photosynthesize in that amount of time it's kind of like the ideal amount of time but i i think that outside of that photosynthesis period um once you move past that that might be where more of the pigmentation of the coral happens because it's already gotten the you know the light energy that it can take mm-hmm. in and at that point maybe it starts you know uh like producing some of those it's, pigments that actually protect it from the sun it's almost like sunscreen in a way yeah I, I, you know so the thing is right we have to remember the corals don't have eyes like we do mm-hmm. so what we can make out from the spectrum of the light um is what we see but then that doesn't mean the light doesn't exist for coral so um, I think there's some research people that point out that they can cross and pick and choose the spectrum of light that they can, they can if they want to take in, even if our human eyes can't see it. Mm-hmm. So um, you're supposed to give them all the spectrum of light that you can give it and then allow them to take whatever, because different, I, I think different species are a little bit different in that regard. That's why they have come in different, different colors, right? Mm-hmm. Colors, different pigment, different GFP. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, so, so, so so I, I, I actually, you know, when I start to read this, and actually, funny you mentioned it, I started to rethink the quotes that I've been doing. Like on the radar, I don't, I don't do any green, I don't do any red, right? Mm-hmm. Because they always people say, I was also, I always give, give people a promote um, uh, some algae growth. Yeah. But, but right now, I, I'm thinking if they, if they designed it, they built it into it, they established a reason for it. And then looking at the sunlight, you put a, you know, split out the spectrum and you get all sorts of all spectrum of all color of the light so i'm thinking i might i might start playing lots of lights too i haven't i haven't been tinkered for a long time but yeah I mean, it's uh, hard to say too though because like you say like the corals that are a certain depth um you know what is the spectrum actually down there like are like i know that red like doesn't like red's one of the first colors to go as you get under yes, water yeah um so like does it really do anything for our corals or is it kind of just like maybe making the colors pop visually a little bit more yeah so so i, I think i'm that's, that's that's exactly right because blue is a very special spectrum the coral use and and i do believe that um i have seen it in my in my own tank where uh, a coral that lit with only blue light well this is not aqua actually this got mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I have a Ghani that lit with only blue light, uh, exhibit a richer, it's like a pink and green. So mm-hmm. it exhibit a richer coloration mm-hmm. than one that was lit in the aqua tank with like full spectrum light. So mm-hmm. um, it is true. And there, there's enough paper I read about the uh, pigment expression um, of aqua uh, stone coral based on blue light versus mm-hmm. other type of lights. And they actually found that blue light, uh, Coral that was lit under enriched blue light uh, ended up with a heavier, not, not only uh, demonstrated uh, more pigment mm-hmm. um, protein, but also grew bigger hmm. than the other ones that lit with enriched red light or green light. So like you're that. saying the ones that had the the red or green light may have also had the same amount of blue light, but they actually grew less with the red and green added. No, no, no. No, no, they, or this they, was they did just... not have any blue light. Yeah, they okay. Did not have any blue light. Okay. So this is a research. I can send you a link later to the paper. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. They did one with a millipore, they did one with acropora pocha, mm-hmm. and then it did uh, with two species of bird's nest and uh, montipore. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I was like, very interested in that because everything that we keep in our tank, I want to know. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. yeah. So 
they validated that you know as much as the hobby hates blue light. I think that that science actually says that there, there is a use. Yeah. Quotes can actually, actually prefer well, it depends on the person. I mean, some people are blue light lovers and some people are, you know, crisp white lovers. It's it's, it's all over the place, really. But yeah. 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 But I mean, it'd be interesting to see a study like that where they did the blue, but then plus the red and the green. And then to see if there's actually any detriment to some colors, you know, like are there colors that are actually like kind of just like not either doing nothing or actually mm -hmm. affecting the coral negatively i i think yeah i, I don't think it negatively affect the coral mm -hmm. uh the, the coral just just kind of like it's like x-ray right like it just doesn't doesn't see it they don't just they don't see that light but if they see the blue spectrum and then excites the gfp but if they don't if they see am i not saying the right gfp um it, it's that that green fluorescent pigment yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah if they see the the blue light, it somehow excites that 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 the the GFP, and then if they see yeah. other light, or they don't see the red spectrum, they don't see the green spectrum, like you know, maybe 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 something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. an interesting thing to kind of fact check or try to read into a little bit more for sure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, are your radions um, are they pros or blues or which which gen are you kind of running? I think we're doing the blue. Uh, most of the still are doing G6 now. Maybe one yeah. or two times still on, still on G5. Yeah. 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 I found the G6 to be a little weak in the white department. I kind of wanted a little more white channel. I didn't love them. Like, to the pro, the pro, or the blue. No, the blue, the G6 blue. I think if I was going to do G6 again, I would get pros. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I yeah, know. that's. I've, I've heard that too. I I think um, I, I don't notice difference because. Um, yeah, I don't know this. I can't even tell. I can't even tell G6 from G5 without looking at I have to look at the map. Yeah. To, to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You probably got a lot of light lights in the shop. Hey, there's probably like, you know, a good 40 or 50 radions in there. <laughs> and maybe not that many. Cause they're, probably gen, they're probably um, XR 30s, but yeah. A lot. Yeah, for sure. So what's your, what do you like for flow? Like, what are you kind of, I mean, you have a lot of, well, actually you have quite a few display systems in the shop, which is kind of cool to see because, you know, you kind of think a farm is going to be more um, like just shallow kind of like raceways or whatever, but um, you probably see a lot of benefit to actually aquascaping a system and maybe using some of those corals as your mother colonies too. Yeah. I mean, Actually, the tub is actually not the best, not the most efficient way in terms of space. Because the thing about display tank, the depth allows you to stack the back row yeah. when they grow out. But on a tub, they gotta be next to each other, mm -hmm. right? So you need more space to grow two corals, where at display tank, you need less space to grow two corals. And then it just looks nicer. Um, and um, the more, you know, you can, see, uh, in the beginning, it's like show tank, right? People come mm -hmm. in, um, whereas the tub is just like, you know, look top down. Yeah, totally. But, um, yeah, and a nice yeah. display is it's kind of more inspiring for the customer, you know, something for them to aspire towards, right? Yeah, yeah. The tongue is really meant for it to grow out and work and frag from and let the frag grow and take pictures. Yeah. And then display really let let the pros to go into the full potential in the colony so people can appreciate, you know, what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, um, looking yeah. at it at it head on in a tank versus in a shallow frag tank. Yeah, so some of our kind of looks ugly, man. Like you yeah. cut it so much, it just like doesn't even look like you know. You allow the core to grow into it. That's the one thing about um, doing a commercial is having a story that uh, you can't. It's, it's hard to let some uh, core grow out into a colony because you got you got to you know if someone comes in they want to buy and we're gonna say no because you got bills to pay. And, yeah, you know and. Um, I yeah, I've just... figured that one out actually. Um, this yeah. is my philosophy on it: is what I would me as a business owner would I pay that much money for that frag myself? <laughs> you know what I mean? Unless it's something I only have one of, which I won't sell because I'm going to grow out that thing I have one of. But yeah. you know, like, well, if it's like an acro that's unique or something. But like, yeah, like, would you pay? So somebody's like, oh, I'll buy that for 250 bucks. And you're like, would you personally pay 250 to keep it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, OK. Yeah, I, I actually look at my angles like this, right? If some company want to buy, buy like a colony, right? I, 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 first of all, the price has to be, you know, on point. The price yeah, kind of right. relative but to, I, yeah. Yeah. But also, then, then even when the price is right, then you have to look at, do I have another backup? 
Okay. Mm-hmm. If I have a backup, it's easier for me to let it go. But if I don't have a backup, then I say, how easy would it for, would it be for me to procure another frag of this coral? Yeah. Because over the years, I I I I've met many people like even right now, I still buy from private like you. If I was local to you, I would probably buy from you. Totally. You know, yeah. wholesale. I would get something from you that I don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, so and then I start going down the list of the people I have. Actually. Yeah, you basically have, have backups in a lot of other people's tanks, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then if I ever need to have one, I just go to it and then I can, you know, buy it back. Yeah. So it all goes into that, but it's hard, man. Like, it, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's something that I grew for 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 a very long time, and if somebody's gave me a lot of money for it, it is still kind of like. Ah, you know, it's not like yeah. easy sale, you know? Yeah, Especially yeah. like a big piece, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, totally. You saw that coral go from a frag to a, you know, a colony. You put your heart and soul into it <laughs> in a way, Yeah, right? the memory. Your so babies, like, like, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Especially if that so. coral went through some rough times and it recovered, you know, that's kind of a little extra, you know, I know. Like yeah, bonus. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it sounds like you have a really good, um, you know, way of sustaining you know, your aquaculture and, and keeping up with the demand. Um, and then also like keeping backups in different systems. So you're kind of like able to like keep things in stock because I'm sure you have pieces that everybody wants that are kind of hard to keep up with the demand, but do you Definitely. find, yeah. Definitely. So, so, you know, we want auctions, right? Yeah. Uh, every week. Um, and the, we have to keep it up every week. We have to hit a certain number and we don't, we miss that week, that's our bread and butter, then we kind of in trouble. Um, so for us to keep up with that kind of uh, selling, mm-hmm. um, not just us, but um, we kind of, I wouldn't say partner, but we have other private hobbyists that's like share the same vision, share the same um, ambition, mm-hmm. uh, uh, motivation for selling. And um, if, you, if, you, if, if you follow our auction long enough, you know some of the pictures don't look always the same because some of the cores actually come from someone else's tank. Yeah. And, yeah. and that way, this allows us to, one, if we keep selling the same stuff that we we grow, people won't get bored. Yeah. So we try to bring someone else in and, and, and one, you know, they have an ex, an ex, an excess of their coral, they can find a revenue to, to sell. We provide that platform and we can sell them. And then they just got to get the hum that they may not get what they you know, want to charge for it. Mm-hmm. So that's the biggest uh, challenge. But once they get into a weekly cash flow, they start to see the cash flow come in. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it, then it's like, okay, I don't have to sell it for this much because I'm selling this every week. Yeah, know? yeah. I get cash flow in every week. That feels a lot better than making a big sale and then you have like a month of hiatus. You know, I'm not yeah. selling anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, you've got to, it, it's part of the, you know, being in this hobby for a while and getting into the business side and, um, you know, having a lot of friends and good relationships as you, you know, you kind of have, yeah, it's you a, know, it's people a very that, small community, yeah, it's definitely small community, especially what we're really doing now. I don't mind me plugging, uh, my, my new platform is the reef and bid the platform auction site. Oh yeah, because for sure. I'll now, put it in the links. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I, what, what used to be competitive, what used to be friendly competitors are now my potential, you know, partners mm-hmm, on the platform, mm-hmm. right? You know, and um, because I, I feel like with 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 the customer, with the with the, with the hobby demanding aquaculture calls now, yeah, and uh, it, it's easy to to uh, you know share the I would say the growing pain, right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, well, we got goal calls now, mm-hmm. and and my ability to keep up with selection. We depend on a thriving hobby, right? If, if, if the hobby people, you know, quit the hobby and then there's less people going cold, then it's actually the, yeah. The, the, the it's in your best business. interest to keep people being successful. So that's yes. why you know coming on a podcast like this and being really transparent about your methods, you're not hiding anything because you want people to do well, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think that's one thing that we lack. Uh, that's one of the, the things that we lack. I want to do more now that we just behind the camera. We just we figure we show more cat pictures of the coral people, you know, but they also want to see who's behind it, who's doing yeah. all this, right? Yeah. And they want to know what the method is, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, what did you say that was the website like, for the auction site? Uh, Reefandbit.com. Okay. Uh, R-E-E-F, little N, E-I-B. Com. Okay, I'm gonna put it in yeah. the in the it, as you say it. I'll put it in the video. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So actually, that kind of gets me to another little thing, and we don't have to get like super deep into this. And also, let me know if you're running low on time or anything, because I know it's pretty late your time. 
But uh, I wanted to ask you about choral naming and kind of at what point mm. if you, because you have some, some POTO pieces, some pieces of the ocean trademark pieces, at what point do you believe like a choral is kind of ready to give it your own trademark name and like, you know, how do you kind of like, you know, how long has it been with you? How do you determine how it's unique from from other corals you've seen to the point of being like, okay, okay. I'm gonna actually give this a give this baby a name. I think well, first of all, right, I I I, um, I, I disagree with the general uh, some of the school of thought about being against designer name mm -hmm. uh, because, like 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 Paletta said, right, the hobby is supposed to be fun, right? Yeah, if everything is just like a nudipora green, a nudipora rainbow. Like, that's just not fun, right? Yeah, no, and I got. Then, I love making the names. It's fun, man. <laughs> yeah, I get excited it's supposed for to be it. fun, right? Yeah. So when you have 20, 50 colonies in the tank and start to keep track of them all, you need the names to identify them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 you know that's 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 the nature of it all. Yeah. Now, as far as giving it your own name, I, I think it's it's. I, I don't want to say you know you shouldn't give your own name. Hey, man, if if you you grew it out, go give it your own name. You know, yeah. even if you took a piece from us. And you decide to name it yourself. Hey, it's your coral now. You know, if you want to name it something else, you name it. But yeah. if you feel like our name sucks, then you, you know, you name give it your own name. Or if you like our name, stick with it. You know. But yeah. I think it's it's up to the 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 person, right? And it should be fun. It just you know, if I think it comes down to the price of it. I don't think a name should really dictate a price. I think it really comes down to the characteristics of the coral. Yeah, it has a backstory. Uh, the man also dictates it, you know, uh, I think it's very simple, right? If we charge something, we overcharge something, they'll let us know. And that's why the auction is so important because we see where, where they fall. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, like if we charge something, oh, I think that's too much. Well, sometimes people buy right out auction. They don't even wait for the auction. To and finish. you're like, oh, I guess we oh, underpriced oh, that oh, one. That's piece <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 So, but so. I, I do think having the, um, you know, the abbreviation of your, you know, company name, it kind of gives it the lineage and, um, you know, I've kind of gotten to a point where there's some corals where like, you know, I have the experience to see a coral and, you know, I'll have a coral that I think is the same and I'll put them in my tank right next to each other and grow them out. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's a couple, uh, I won't mention the names, but, um, you know, I gave them a good chance. It's been like six, eight months and I'm like, these are two corals that sell for a lot of money that I know at this point have got to be the same coral. Um, you know, it's like, it's tough because sometimes I don't want to give something a brand new name because like, there's already a good name for it out there that explains it, but mm -hmm. I can't really call it that because, you know, I, like, I, you know, what am I call it? Frag garage home wrecker. You know, it's like, I don't know, like, for example, like it's, right, it's right. a tough I one. I mean, that's, that's, it. that's, that's what, well, that's an except that's a very extreme case, right? I think the problem comes in when someone tried to pass a coral off as something else, that's not it. And and I actually got yeah. that. Um, See, that's one of my concerns before. too. Yeah. So so that that's that's actually that's where the our goofy homework comes from. So I bought mm -hmm. the colony as homework from Jason. Mm -hmm. And it, and then I, I called the guy and like it doesn't look like it. And they said, No, I got it directly from Jason himself. You know? Mm -hmm. And then I even so I had have Jason, you know, and then he's like, I don't know, man, I sucks a lot of people. So I let that thing sit. I feel maybe it just lost some color, but um, unfortunately, we were got we got scooped. You know, like that's why we're like, you know what? We can sign as home record, but I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. Kind of goofy that it's you know what that's how the name came about. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and I think I've seen the pictures of that piece, and it's pretty awesome, <laughs> like how it turned. It's out. awesome now, yeah, 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 but it's definitely not a home record, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you say, I guess that's a pretty good conclusion on the name game thing. I, I think, you know, I mean, I guess one other thing I would say is, um, I do like how, you know, zoanthids have a more universal naming system, but I think the reason that works is because zoanthids are like, they don't look very different from tank to tank, whereas like Acropora can look very different from tank to tank. So you know, you could see the same coral in two different tanks and, and totally not think it's the same thing. Right. You know. So, not going to lie, I've been out of the doors game for a long time now uh, because I couldn't check over the names. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, but they do, I mean, like, you know, the Krakatoa, they share very certain distinct characteristics. You know, the mm -hmm. skirt, you can tell if it's like that. Yeah. Um, but there are times where the lighting has a lot of uh, play in this too because Azor can definitely 
you know, change to a different color based on lighting. As also the, the maturity the age of the polyp. The mm-hmm. Rainbow Incinerator, which is a great example because I've had, you know, the Rainbow Incinerator? Yeah. When it's it's got that crazy pattern. Like yeah. They yeah. pop but when like, it's baby. Yeah. It's just like a, like a, like a blue circle in the middle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I kind of, I kind of hands off on the, on the zone. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, we have, uh, my, 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 my staff are more, uh, uh, expert, I'm more of an expert in that, in mm-hmm. that area than I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I honestly, like, I mean, I do sell Zoas, but I kind of hate messing around with them. Like, it's just, you know, there's always that fear of, you know, the palytoxins and, and um, I do find oh, that yeah. they're they're kind of prone to weird bacterial infections that you know other corals aren't. You know, sometimes you can lose a whole colony of them pretty fast from you know just one polyp closes one day and then the colony yeah. starts melting. Um, That's a different game yeah. too. I, I you know back in the day it's always with just like a few strings out there. You know the tough blue. The, yeah. You know. That's old, old, old time. Now, so many, but I, I think it's a good problem to have, though, because all these different strings coming out, people can have fun with it. You know, it, it's great. We just got to, I guess, if, you, if you're if you enthusiast in that area, mm-hmm. you, would, you would be, you know, you would, you would know, right? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, you know, just, I mean, one of the things I, I'm excited about in the hobby these days is, like, I, I just keep continuing to be surprised by new morphs and, and colors and things that I just never imagined I would see. Like, do you find that like, especially the past sort of five years or so? Yeah, that's what what keeps the hobby so interesting for me. Is that everything, every day, or we learn something new, and then in the soil, you know, I'm gonna tell people the reason why I'm into soil is because you look at the tank, the next day there's always something new mm-hmm. that you never never seen before, and then you start going on Google or whatever and start looking it up. So in time, if you're curious, you know, inquisitive by nature, this is the great hobby to have, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, especially with what you just mentioned, right? I mean, with Jamie Craig's on your pocket mentioning the, the, the splice, uh, yeah. you know, that you're working on that, I'm very excited about, um, you know, because we, I, I try to do, I try to do some splice, but we're unsuccessfully, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, and he, uh, he I explains, know. I mean, I'll give the gist if the audience hasn't listened to the episode, but basically they, they figured out the whole splice corals thing is essentially two separate genomes in the same coral. And this happens during the settlement because when these larvae settle, they're more open to merging with other other corals so and especially yeah. of the same same species but it's the the two genomes so i guess in the case of something like reef raft splice um like i know jason at reef raft um he saw like a little a little it was originally a red millie and he saw a little mm-hmm. yellow streak and he isolated that little section and what we thought at the time was that the yellow streak was like a fluorescent protein infection but what it turns out based on what jamie said is i guess it's more likely it's a whole separate genome. It's like a chimera in the same coral. And mm-hmm. maybe the coral was just presenting most of the red color, but the yellow was in there. So once mm-hmm. you change the ratio, you can start growing out these splice corals. That being said, I, I know some of the grafting that um, like Top Shelf and Worldwide have done, they've done grafting with putting Monty's together until they actually get along. So I think that's possible as well. Right. Then you have cases where the same coral decided to go their own way, right? That's a question you got to ask. Them. Yeah. What, what's going on? Is it possible? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be cool. I mean, imagine like I just in a decade or something like that, if people get right. really dialed in on this stuff, then we'll have some insane multicolor corals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like four different colors, right? Yeah. 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 Totally. <laughs> um, is there anything else you're kind of excited for coming up in terms of I don't know anything on the horizon for the shop or like uh, any any new equipment or anything you're excited about. Um, equipment wise, I'm old school, right? So so yeah. I don't necessarily keep up with the with the newer gadget. Typically, considering like people have been successful at keeping SPS for a long time without the fancy gadget, totally. but it's, it's fun. You know, I'm not against it. I think the the thing that I'm most excited about is. I have two little uh, side projects going on right now. One is the, the moon signer for two of my tanks. Mm-hmm. And I'm, uh, we're going to coach our own file plants in the store mm-hmm. so that we can start uh, giving that little. Because that's one area that I never got the chance to uh, mm-hmm. try. 
So, um, you know, I'm looking into that area right now. Yeah. Go a specific strain of phytoplankton because my research into trace element micronutrient kind of touched upon how uh, it's related to what the phytoplankton can provide for the coral, if not the coral, but the, the microfauna. But the, the, yeah, the symbionts yeah. for mm-hmm. the coral. Um, and then in which in turn benefit the coral. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's a complicated process, but I, I kind of want to get into it. Yeah, once you get the cultures going, I think, and if you have help at the shop, you can probably get that happening. I know the first guest I had on the podcast was Leo uh, Leonardo's Reef, um, and he was saying that he saw big results when he started culturing his own um, live food yeah. systems, you know, so... Um, yeah, and that's cool because you can sell those cultures too, right? Like people can come in and get a bottle of Fido or will you do road right. first too? Or? Yeah, we can, but my goal is really to feed the store, um, yeah. to, to get, get extra growth, get some, you know, get the benefit of it all mm-hmm. from it at the store. But I think selling, to be honest, selling coal is probably more, you know, more, uh, better for us than selling bottle plants. You know? Yeah, no, that's true. We're not opposed to it. Of course, we're not opposed to selling plants. Did you yeah. know that we were doing fresh water shrimp? What's that? The time? Did you know that we're doing fresh water shrimps? Oh, no. Yeah, like, you know, those new car- carabiners, these carabiners? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing that for, for, for I think, for a year or so. Okay. Uh, That's yeah, kind of yeah. fun. Something different. <laughs> yeah, something completely different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I got a bit of a funny question for you. Um, what do you think is your, like, most important lesson or biggest mistake you've ever had? That maybe maybe could help be helpful to people <laughs> in reefing or in general in, in, in life no in reefing <laughs> um that's a good one um i made you know why is it a good one because i made a lot of mistakes yeah a lot. yeah it's a good opportunity uh, but, to have some humility <laughs> right now but i think the, the the key is mindset right uh the growth mind so it's, the, the thing is, there's a lot of information out there, and it's easy to get caught up in like one person's success. Um, but then you realize, how come I can't be successful at it? So I, I think critical thinking is very important because um, when I first got into the hobby, right, um, I had uh, I had issue with red bugs, mm-hmm. and I, I was my first encounter with red bugs. So I, I looked up, and I don't know, I think it's an old um, form. I think it's recent. And then someone mentioned something about freshwater dipping the aqua. Yeah, right? that's all we knew so, to do. That was the dipping back in the day, freshwater dip. So without thinking twice, I went and dipped my aqua for, for red bull, and I mm-hmm. killed it. Yeah. You know? um, so I, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the information out there is great, but always kind of like get, you know, get a full picture of that. You know, oftentimes it's, it's easy to get caught up in someone's success and then try to replicate that without... Yeah. Taking consideration that every fish, every reef tank is like a fingerprint. If you yeah. I think the yeah, let me think is that I just try try to like follow, you know, do this and then do that, but ended up, you know, nothing worked. Um, yeah, those but are I, I would say also as a counterpoint to that is sometimes following a really successful hobbyist methodology and not getting too convoluted from all of the information that's out there is also a good approach because yeah, you you're, know, you're correct. I think yeah. I think what I should I, what I should say was um, the technique. Yeah, you should follow somebody that's successful mm-hmm. and then try to replicate that and then try to learn from it, right? But not to to take a simple thing that that one person does. And expect big return when you try to apply to your own tank. Mm-hmm. So um, I think totally. that's 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 the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will also say that um, you know since Adam, you're 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 busy on your small business, you're starting up your business. I, I think one thing is that no, um, if you're trying to start selling coal for a living, right? The biggest lesson I've learned is uh, know your limit, right? So I mean, of course, you know, being being this is your baby, you want to do everything yourself. But it took me a long time to realize it that having a good team around you is very, very important. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be the smart person in the room, but you want to bring the smart people in the room with you, right? So, yeah. I, I think one key to to total success, if you want to call it that, um, is it, having the right team, having the right people around you, and it's very, very beneficial. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's hard to let go. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you have to. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm just at a point of potentially getting, you know, a part time employee, you know, one or two days a week. Right. Um, because, yeah, I'm a one man operation and, and I like it that way. Like I like it's a home based business. 
I don't have a retail shop. People don't really come here. There's nothing wrong with know? that. There's nothing wrong with yeah, that. Yeah, and like it's low yeah. overhead. But, um, you know, sometimes I'm like, I just want somebody to scrub those gyres, you know? <laughs> like, I don't want to do that crap. Like, get somebody else to do that. Yeah, and, so, you and, can some, so you can splice some macros, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can spend time on the fun stuff, the fun experimentation. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it, you know, I mean, you um, you have a bigger population around you. I'm on an island, a smaller island. Well, I guess you're on an island too. It's just a much more populated one. I'm in a city of. Well, I'm, three... near, I'm near New York, so. Yeah. I'm near New York. Yeah, yeah it's 350,000 people on Vancouver or in Victoria, I think is the the. Yeah. So you know, our our reef community is not huge. Um, so you know, if I get somebody to work for me part time, it would be hopefully a hobbyist that's you know knowledgeable. But um, yeah, we'll see. I'm I'm not close yeah, to it, but uh, yeah, yeah. Any, you know I'm happy to help it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. anything you know. Yeah, well, you got a yeah. Sounds like you have an awesome team, so I'm I'm envious of that. But uh, again, it's like like you say with the auctions and all of that stuff, it's pressure because it's overhead. It's uh it's an ongoing um you know uh, system that needs to keep you know renewing. Yeah, cash flow, mm -hmm. cash flow for the business. Yes. Yeah, so totally. An auction provides that for it. So. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Well, um, sometimes you do the rapid fire questions, but it always ends up taking a long time. So maybe I'll just jump to the uh, to the final question, if that sounds good for you, to I close off that. on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is my kind of like uh, thought experiment question. I'm sure you've heard it on the podcast before. If you were to have the financial means and you know the life situation uh, to do so, would you do a polo reef style reef? And if if so, or if not, what would you do differently? Um, I would do a variation of it. I would do. Um, I've always imagined that uh, 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 a tank that I could smoke from top down. Mm -hmm. So I would build a bridge over it. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, like a step, like a step, but not just like a, a, a random walk bridge you walk on, but like a nice bridge. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would have the tank um, be also viewable. Well, that top also kind of slopes down into a beach, right? Okay. Uh, if I don't want to just dive in and yeah. smoke, I could do that as well. So that that that's that's what I would do. And then obviously, you know, um, actually, I, I I have seen Andrew's tank. And, yeah. Um, you have to be careful what you wish for because despite all the uh, resources that you had, it's still a big operation. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a constant uh, battle, or you know, this and that. You know how it is. You yeah. have a tank, you know. Well, and yeah, like and he, he's not it's just easy. putting everything on to people that work for him and or whatever. He's pretty hands-on with all of that stuff, too, right? So um, He's like, pretty uh, hands-on. He's, yeah. He's, 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 yeah, he's, he's pretty hands-on, but still, like, your mind, it's always, like, plus, plus, he's, um, you know, he's trying to do some good out of it. I think he's trying to give back to me a lot, make it meaningful, make it meaningful, despite all of this. Yeah. So, besides the tank, he also has to produce content and travel and do all the things so a lot of responses that come from that so I, I imagine if i had that kind of you know i was in that i had that kind of uh access i would be just as well known as you would be then you you know carries certain responsibility mm -hmm. but then i think i would probably also do a call bank you know you know understanding that banking of all the geno or the genotype or totally. the um you know frozen you know free, just in case you know something happened yeah and you're able to replicate that type of uh, eco ecosystem yeah totally. i would do like a like a huge you know, like you know the, the food bank right i would do a big you know uh, uh coral bank yeah and the I funny part of that i mean i think in australia there's a there's a coral bank but um and that's just going to be probably australian corals but um you know some of the corals that you would need in the coral bank are kind of like not really beautiful corals as far as the aquarium hobby is concerned you know some of them are just going to be brown or green kind of brain yeah type that's what corals. they say right majority yeah. like like actually majority of corals in the wild is brown and tan mm -hmm. and yeah and some of those corals are the most important ones for building the foundation of a reef too so yeah yeah, yeah. but you know a color is not everything for me the shape is important now you know like when you grow something out into spectacular like even uh you know normal you know, bird nest and whatnot when it's big and magnificent, it's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, totally, so. totally. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so the the my um, breakdown of that is that you would have a bridge that you can kind of look down and view from above, and then potentially kind of like a sand kind of entrance <laughs> entrance point. Yeah, like a beach, like a <laughs> yeah. beach. You know. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay, I like yeah, it. That'd be cool. Yeah. Cool, so man. So everyone can join. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything what about else? You, actually, oh, what about oh you, hey, nobody ever asked me that. Um, what about you? Yeah. Uh, funny enough, I haven't put a ton of thought into it either. Um, <laughs> I think I would probably say um, I wouldn't want to tank that deep. Um, I would do something shallower, um, probably shallower and longer. I mean, I like the water volume. I think that's enough to kind of, you know, get kind of like a good feel with. But I kind of want to get my hands in there and maybe be able to get in it, you know. And yeah, I mean, maybe just the depth of it is, uh, I mean, I, I guess part of it is if you if you need to clean it, you have to get in it in terms of Andrew's tank. Um, it would be nice to have the option to clean the glass from the outside too. I think that- You don't uh, have to yeah. clean it. No? You have someone else cleaning for it. Oh, well, that's true. That's true. But I I mean, yeah, but I mean, how many how many times a week does the glass get cleaned? I wonder how how often it gets cleaned. Probably pretty regularly. You should ask him. Yeah, yeah, him yeah. yeah, for sure. I'd like to get him on at some point. But yeah, I think I would probably go shallower and longer. Um, but other than that, I mean, just the room itself is just so beautiful. Like, it's just such a beautiful presentation. Um, yeah, and, you know, some people give me interesting answers that they would do more of a bio, biotope kind of style thing where they'd have, mm -hmm. you know, more of a regional type, you know, like a, a few acros that are, you know, just massive colonies as opposed to just this huge mishmash of things from across the world. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. You know, I got to think about it more. But uh, I think that would be the main thing. It would just be a dimension, different in dimensions. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, you, and we'll still be acro, right? We'll yeah. Be I mean, you know, and like, I think I probably would, um, I wouldn't overlook things like monty caps and stuff like that because even though the yeah they're going to grow too fast it's like those are corals that look amazing from standing you know 10 feet back or 20 feet back you know you want those corals yeah. that are going to just have a really beautiful shape um and fill the tank out so and you can always pull that stuff out and hack it down anyways so yeah yeah because yeah. those rainbow tenuous aren't going to look like much from from 10 feet away <laughs> you know <laughs> You can't see the splice ring. You can't see the rainbow splice from no. 10 feet away. Absolutely. Yeah, it probably looks brown. You know, when you take yellow and red and put them together, it's, you know, kind of an orangey brown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thanks for asking. You're the first to ask me. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you got you to, gotta, you know, you got an interview. Yeah, so. for sure. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to mention just in terms of things coming up or any any plugs? I'm going to release this episode pretty pretty quick. So. Um, um, uh, no, I mean, uh, Ruth and Biz is actually taking a chunk of my time right now. Yeah. Aside from photo. So that's going to be a big deal when you, when you find on board to, to the new seller. So cool. I okay. look for that, look for that to be coming. I'm working very tirelessly behind the scene right now on that. Uh, that's very exciting. And, um, and, uh, yeah. And just go more coral, you know? Yeah. Cool. Coral. All right. Awesome, man. Well, thanks right. so much for your time, and uh, thanks for staying up late for me. And no uh, you know, I'll, let's uh, let's chat again, maybe like six months or something, when you've had a good go with the moonshiners, and we'll 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 see how it's you know what it's for done. Sure. For you. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay. Fun. Awesome, man. Fun. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Reef with Kenny Lin from Pieces of the Ocean. Again, you can check out his website at piecesoftheocean.com. If you are a seller in the United States and you need a good platform to sell frags, you can go to reefandbid.com and apply to be a seller there, as well as customers can go there to buy frags. I'm going to link to the Worldwide Corals video in the show notes that we discussed because you can see a really awesome tour of their facility. If you have any suggestions for future guests, uh, want to just ask us a question, make a suggestion, make a criticism, whatever you want to say, uh, feel free to reach out at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And if you're looking for high quality aquacultured corals in Canada, please check us out at fraggarage.ca. Hope to hear from you soon.